should you take a probiotic if you have HPV and cervical dysplasia? I suppose the real question is, is there a relationship between the organisms found in the vaginal environment and the, um, the gut environment and HPV and dysplasia? The answer is, yes, there is a relationship there. And studies have shown that women who have bacterial vaginosis have a more likelihood that they're going to have HPV as well as have persistent HPV. And there's also a relationship between bacterial vaginosis and cervical dysplasia. We also know that alterations in the gut and vaginal microbiomes are associated with a variety of, cerv of cancers, including cervical cancer, uterine, and ovarian cancers. So there's definitely a relationship between the organisms. And that sort of makes sense. I mean, you know, the health of the vaginal environment is really dependent in a large part on the types of bacteria that are there. In the vaginal environment, you wanna see low diversity, you wanna see high lactobacilli numbers. In other words, you don't wanna see a, a lot of different types of organisms there. That's very different than the gut. The gut, you wanna see a lot of diversity. So um, diversity is a reflection of healthy gut ecology or a healthy bacterial environment. So it's the opposite in the vagina where you don't want a lot of different types of numbers. Bacterial vaginosis is associated with an increase in the numbers of types of bacteria, including things like Gardnerella, which is one of the organisms that's associated with bacterial vaginosis. Um, so an imbalance in the organisms or a dysbiosis in the vaginal environment is going to make you more prone to having HPV, having persistent HPV, having cervical dysplasia. Um, also, those alterations are reflected in the gut. In fact, there's an interesting, you know, some interesting research that's showing even the state of your oral health has an, in, uh, um, an impact on vaginal flora. We know that women who have uh, gingivitis or, and whether it's symptomatic or not doesn't matter. So even women who have high numbers of oral bacteria um, but aren't having any actual symptoms of gingivitis have an increased likelihood of having vaginal um, BV. And, um, and if you're symptomatic, it's e even worse. And most importantly, we know that probiotics can help uh, clear HPV and help clear cervical dysplasia. There is research that's shown that. So what's my favorite probiotic? You know, I, I have to go through a little bit of history here because I started using probiotics back in the 90s. Um, I started working a lot with gut health and diet back around 1995. The first time, for example, the first time that I wrote about leaky gut syndrome or intestinal hyperpermeability was in 1996. So you know, all along, all, all the while I've been in practice, I've done a lot with gut function. So I started using, like everybody else, I mean, the thinking is, you know, probiotics are supposed to help, right? So I didn't have a lot of experience in practice in, in the late 90s, so I was using probiotics. But what I found was over time, I just, I just didn't seem to be getting the results that I was looking for. So by the early, maybe mid-2000s, I kind of stopped using probiotics for the most part. And I used a lot of different probiotics. I mean, I've used different types of lactobacillus species and bifidobacter. I've used soil-based organisms. Um, I've used competitive types of yeast and things like that. So I've done a lot of different probiotics and prebiotics and all these different things. And despite all that, I just, and despite research saying that they're supposed to help. So, I mean, the research has been there for a long time, but in practice, clinically, I wasn't, I just wasn't finding them very useful. So I, for the most part, I kind of backed off on them until maybe about 2013, I came across um, a probiotic that I really like, which is um, the Megaspore Biotic. So what's unique about this product, and I have the link in the video description below, it, it, um, that link takes you right to the registration page for the company that produces this. So you can actually register because you link, um, go through my link and then you can order direct from the company um, if you so choose. But um, what, makes, what makes a Megaspore Biotic unique is that it actually uses spores. So what a spore is, a spore is a, um, is a phase of a life cycle that some bacteria go through where they can form sort of encapsulate and form a protective barrier around them that allows them to, um, you know, to suffer 
all sorts of different environmental conditions. So for example, spore, you can boil spores and it doesn't kill them. Spores can go through your stomach acid and are not infected, they are not affected by that in any way, shape or form. So spores are unique in that ability. Most bacteria are very sensitive to environmental conditions, including lactobacilli. One of the reasons I, I kind of, I think there's a problem with lactobacilli is that they're not very resilient to normal environmental conditions. So when you, even when you eat fermented foods or you take something like yogurt, um, or sauerkraut or other fermented foods, most of those lactobacilli species end up being killed in the stomach because of the acid. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't do anything because there's all sorts of evidence that eating fermented foods is good for you and that taking some of those lactobacillus species seem to be good for immunity and for gut function. I think what it is is that even though those organisms are dead, they still have the ability to elicit some favorable effect in the intestine. The difference with a spore though is that a, a spore, once it goes through the stomach and goes through that acidic condition, goes into what's called a vegetative phase where it actually comes alive. So it was sort of in a dormant phase in the spore um, in, when it's a spore and then it, it becomes a, a living organism once it goes into the vegetative phase in your lower intestine. So it goes through the stomach, it's in your lower intestine and it actually starts doing things. And what it starts doing is producing different types of compounds. This is the website um, for the manufacturer of Megaspore Biotic. Um, so again, that link brings you to the registration page on this website, but there's a lot of good information. There's research listed on this site as well that, that, that talks about why Megaspore Biotic is, is so great and everything. But like I was saying, these are the five uh, spore-based bacilli bacteria that are in the megaspore biotic. And as I was saying, you know, they go through the stomach, so they become, you know, they're alive. They go into the lower intestine. And because they're living organisms, they do things. So, for example, Bacillus indicus produces carotenoid compounds like lycopene, astaxanthine, beta-carotene, and lutein. There is an association between carotenoid compounds and HPV and cervical dysplasia. We know that higher levels of carotenoids are helpful at clearing HPV as well as getting rid of cervical dysplasia. So all of these organisms are doing different things. They're all helping stimulate immunity, but things they're also doing individually, they're doing different things. Bacillus subtilis produces natokinase and vitamin K2, also helps with gut-associated uh, lymphatic tissue or the GALT, which is really important with overall immunity. So these are all helping with immune function. They're all producing different things. They're all helping to support a healthy microbial environment in the gut. So these bacteria can help limit the growth of other bacteria that you might not want to have. Now, if you end up taking this probiotic, you want to look at dosing here. Um, you want to ultimately get up to two capsules a day with food. So you want to take two capsules with food. You always want to take these with food. That's very different than something like lactobacilli. So for example, like I said, a lot of lactobacilli, you might have to refrigerate them. You've got to take them on an empty stomach. The reason you have all those instructions with those types of organisms is that they're sensitive to the, um, the environment and they're, they're going to end up dying. These are different that they come alive and because they're living organisms, they need to eat. So you need to feed them. So you take them with food. Now, the reason why there's dosing instructions um, associated with this probiotic is that it's a very strong probiotic and in some people they can actually have some symptoms associated when they start taking this. Now that doesn't happen very often. I've used this probiotic for a long time and maybe 5% of the time, maybe 10% of the time, uh, there's going to be a person that's sensitive to this. Usually it's people that have a lot of gut issues. So if you have something like irritable bowel disease or inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, maybe IBS like um, irritable bowel syndrome. But if you have a functional uh, disorder, especially if you have an inflammatory type gut disorder, you may end up having some increased symptoms initially when you start taking it. So you want to ramp it up really slowly. Some people, believe it or not, some people even need to start with a small amount, like a half a capsule and then work up from there. So I personally, unless you have IBD, you know, maybe IBS, I would just start with two capsules a day with food. If you think if, if you end up having symptoms, well, then I would back off and start with a lower dose, like maybe the half capsule, something like that. But if you know you have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, I would start with a 
um, probably a smaller dose from the very beginning. Now I've been focusing on the oral use of probiotics for HPV and cervical dysplasia. You might be asking yourself, well, why not use them vaginally? And you can, but the reason I favor doing a oral route of um, of probiotics is that what's happening in your gut is going to affect the vaginal flora. Um, for example, I mentioned that gingivitis is associated with bacterial vaginosis. Your mouth via your intestine is about 26 feet away from your vagina and yet if you're having poor oral health it's going to increase, the, it's going to change the bacteria vaginally. So what's happening in your gut is, is having a direct impact on vaginal flora. We know this. You know, so that being said, and I think you're getting the additional benefit by the fact that there's a lot going on with your gut as it relates to immunity. If you spread the intestine completely flat, it's about the size of a tennis court, um, and you have 100 trillion bacteria that are living on the surface of that, you know, that, that surface area, and they're doing a lot of things. And you also have about 70% of your immune system is affiliated with the gut. It's the gut-associated lymphatic tissue. So there's a lot going on in the gut. It's very, very important. Um, now, that being said, could you do you know, a direct sort of probiotic vaginally? Yes, you can, and um, I did that for many years. I had a really nice lactobacilli suppository. It was a cocoa butter-based type of lactobacillus um, that you could use vaginally. You know, honestly, I never really see, I didn't see a lot of difference with it. You know, I was using it for things like bacterial vaginosis and yeast and things like that. And, I tended to get better results when I tried to address diet and kind of overall health and then maybe use some antibacterial or anti-yeast types of suppositories. Those I found very helpful for BV and, and yeast. But using lactobacilli vaginally, I just, I just never really seemed like I noticed a difference. You can use um, the megasporbiotic vaginally. Again, I haven't done that a lot. I haven't found that necessary. But certainly you could um, open a capsule up and use it a little bit vaginally or you could even insert the capsule but I would um, focus at least initially on, on doing it orally. So who should take a probiotic um, or when should you take a probiotic? I think that, I suppose anybody that has HPV is probably not a, a bad idea to take um, the Megaspore biotic, but it's especially true if you have persistent HPV or you have persistent dysplasia, then I think I, you absolutely should be taking a probiotic. Um, what you should also be doing is changing your diet because obviously what you eat is going to modify both the gut bacteria as well as vaginal um, bacteria. So there's a benefit. Um, it makes it almost makes more it makes more sense in the long run to be doing a plant-based diet, a high fiber plant-based diet to support healthy bacteria than just taking a probiotic. So you know, whereas I would take a probiotic to you know, for a short duration, maybe three months or six months to help clear HPV and cervical dysplasia. I have to say that I'm not, I'm not necessarily a proponent of saying, well, take the probiotic all the time. I don't think that we should have to take a probiotic all the time. I think that if you eat really well and eat a high fiber plant-based diet, it, um, it eliminates the need to be taking a probiotic on a regular basis. So again, I have the link to the registration page uh, for the Megaspore Biotic in the video description below. Please like this video, and um, if you find it useful, um, share it and subscribe to my channel.